Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And we've been getting to know our church family, our church culture a little better. We've been spending the last couple of weeks doing that. So two weeks ago, we talked about worship. Even within this series, Amos came up, perfect time to talk about worship and how we see worship here at C3 Church. We've been, well, over the last few years, kind of moving to try to get the church so that this is the one and only program guide. That's it. We don't need a worldly overlay. We don't need like this, yeah, but God, and also you forgot something. No, he didn't forget anything. It's all in here and it's perfect. But sadly, in the modern church, they put overlays, things on top of it. we got to add to it, even though he says don't do that. And so we've been trying to kind of nail that down over the last couple of weeks. Getting to know us better, Heather shared the rest of her story with you. I'm trying to show you guys we're very transparent. We want you to come as you are, but not stay as you are. That is real church, real people. It's a family. Now, I know it's really serious for the beginning of one of my sermons, right? <laughs> like, what is happening now? Who did what? Right, was it me? Oh, no. No. <laughs> Here comes the joke. So, as a part of Heather's testimony, she couldn't help but talk about New York. That's where we're from. Nobody is from here, unless you're very young, right? So, we're from New York. We moved here about 10 years ago. We had businesses there. And I can honestly say I'm almost, almost a fully adjusted Floridian. <laughs> I do not dress like this during the week. It is sandals. But almost, I have almost found good food. Almost. <laughs> there are some now, and it's debatable because I had a friend from New York kind of say this to me, correct me. I said, ooh, there's really good pizza at such and such a place. And they're like, you've been here way too long, man. You, you, you got to go back. But I seem to think that there are some pretty... So I've adjusted. At least it's acceptable. I'm not complaining or crying about the food anymore. So that's a good thing. But here is what I cannot adjust to. I just don't think it's ever going to happen. And that is the driving down here. It's atrocious. Deputy Johnson. We're going to talk about him. <laughs> it is crazy. Now, let me just explain something to you. If you're from New York, you're going, to, you're going to nod a lot today, an awful lot. It's hard to get a license there. My wife and I both failed our driving test the first time we took it. And they make it really hard on purpose. And now you're going to say, no, they're not. They're aggressive. Like people who visit there, they complain, oh, New Yorkers are so... No, 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 no. It's a beautiful ballet of aggression. <laughs> That's what driving. You think of like, like birds, you know, like a flock of birds or bees, if you will. They're swarming, but it's, it's all a ballet. It's beautiful. We know what we're doing. People here, not so much. My daughter got her driver's license. I think she just went to the DMV and asked nicely. <laughs> I think that's how you get your driver's license here. It's like, really? Should she be driving? That's kind of crazy. Now, Naples, where stop signs are a suggestion, right? So it's, all the rules are broken. But there's one thing in particular that I want to address this morning. I, just, I, need, I need to get this out there. It is proper lane usage. That is my real pet peeve. Proper lane. So I've got to teach you guys this today, just in case you don't know. It's just important. Let me get it off my chest, and we'll get to the Bible. <laughs> so, okay. If you're looking over here, now, this can get confusing, so I'm going to help you. This is my right hand, but it is your left. Are, are we good? Okay, are you, I can, okay. Which hand is which? This is, but this lane for you, not me, for you, and this is going to get confusing, I know, but st over here, this, if it's a three-lane road, right, so imagine three lanes, and the, I'm going to get run over. So three lanes, this for you, not me. This is what I call the fast lane or the passing lane. And so let's talk about that lane. If you're in that lane, you should be passing someone. 
That's your job. All right, so that's your lane. You need to be passing. Now, this has been verified by Deputy Johnson, so it's got an official seal. If you're in this lane and you're doing the speed limit, you're not passing anyone, and now you've passed several exits, you can get pulled over. You can get a ticket for that. Am I going to get an amen? Oh, he left room. Anyway, you can get a ticket for that. That's a real thing. That's a real, yeah, New Yorkers are like, uh-huh. So what you need to do if you've passed several exits, you know, I'm not talking, you can, for a reasonable amount of time, get over there and then, you know, make your turn. There's a thing called a blinker. If it's on this side of the steering column, you push that down, and that tells everybody who's not a prophet on the road that you're, you're about to change lanes and then make a turn, right? So they understand. That's great, great. But if you're not doing that, you need to push the blinker up and that lets all the people on the road who are not prophets know that you're going to move over into the next lane I want to talk about. The middle lane, right? So this is the traveling lane. So speed limit, let's say it's 45 miles per hour. This is where you're going to do the speed limit. And you're just going to travel along, right? That's the traveling lane. Now, if... Now, see, this is a thing down here. So I talked about the kids, right? They have their Cracker Jack box driver's licenses. Well, on the other side of things, people come down here, they retire, and they discover something called day drinking. It's a real thing. And so for those people, you're going to find them over here, right, in the slow lane, or I'm about to give up lane, or I'm about to get pulled over lane. Or some people call this, yes, I said day drinking in church. If you're new here, those of you who are not, you're like, this is not a surprise. Trust me, it's, it's a wild ride, people. <laughs> Go back and listen to my wife's testimony. Anyway, so this lane here is the turning lane, slow lane, or I'm about to give up lane, right? Right here, I can't handle it. This is too stressful. Get over there. You need to be over there. Now, Let's go back to the fast lane. So if you're traveling in that lane, you may have had this happen to you. <laughs> you may have had someone ride right up, and I'm not going to say it, just really close to you, bumper to bumper, really close. And then if you look, they're from New York. they got a New York plate, and because they don't realize yet that you don't need the front plate here, that's pretty awesome, so they still have their front plate on. <laughs> and they're talking to you. Here's what they're going to do. They're going to start talking. They're going to talk, and sometimes this lever, if you pull back on it, it flashes, and they're going to talk with their headlights, and they're going to flash it about five times the first time. Get out of the way. Stay in your, right? So, but if you get more than five flashes, those are words I can't say in church. So that's, that's what's going to happen, and they're going to persist because that's their lane. Stay in your lane. You belong in the travel lane, and they're just going to stay on it. They're going to be very persistent. That's the right thing to do. <laughs> Here is what people do in Florida. This is the wrong thing to do. So in Florida, they start the same way. Voop, right up your... So they're there, real close, right? No front plate. They're from Florida. Here we go. And they're going to give it a couple seconds and then get antsy. Then they're going to decide, I'm just going to take over all the lanes. So they're without no blinker, no nothing. They're going to pff, strafe middle lane guy right behind them. Oh, dear, you know. So there, they're going to wake drunk guy up. Then that's not enough. That's not enough. They have to go back across all the lanes. they got to take ownership of every lane that there is, and they're going to strafe. And if you're a middle lane person, this, this is what you say. This is great. Middle lane person says this. Where are the cops when this happens? Where are the cops? Where are the cops when this happens? Where's Deputy Johnson? You're going to start calling him. Now you're on your phone. So, yeah, right? But where are the cops? <sighs> That's middle lane. Where are the cops? You've said that. Right across. Then that person is going to get in the fast lane, slow down, so that the person policing the left lane, they've deputized themselves, they're, it's the speed limit, it's 45, right? They're in that lane, and, <laughs> and I won't say your name, and then, whoop, right there, so that they can see who that person voted for, their stick figure family, and the Jesus fish on the back of their car. Thank you for being a wonderful brand ambassador. <laughs> uh, yeah, we have fun. 
We find ourselves in the rest of the story where we're talking about driving because they had cars in the New Testament, right? No, they did not. We talked about worship. Now we find ourselves at Uzziah. We're in 2 Kings. And so we talked about prophets. We're going to be taking some of those books of the Bible and reinserting them in the accounts of the kings. We're not going to necessarily do that today. We'll do that again next week. But we're looking here at Uzziah. You can watch these messages in our app online if you want to get caught up. It'll take you about, oh, two or three years. Anyway, <laughs> so just read your Bible. You'll be good. So 2 Kings 15.1, Uzziah, and I inserted this in here because some Bible versions have his other name there, making it even more confusing. So same guy, two different names. Son of Amaziah, who got assassinated, began to rule over Judah in the 27th year of the reign of King Jeroboam II of Israel. He was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 52 years. His mother was Jechaliah from Jerusalem. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as his father Amaziah had done. But... He did not destroy the pagan shrines, and the people still offered sacrifices and burned incense there. The Lord struck the king with leprosy, which lasted until the day he died. He lived in isolation in a separate house. The king's son, Jotham, was put in charge of the royal palace, and he governed the people of the Lord. So a couple things at play there. If you don't understand the Bible, leprosy, skin disease, it's something you get, it's not good, and so they kind of separate you. They put you in like a quarantine. You're outside the camp if you read the Old Testament, so that's why they don't want to spread this disease around. Now, here's the thing. You might think, if you're just reading this, oh, the pagan shrines. That's why God struck him with the leprosy, and I've seen even pastors kind of make mistakes here because they're not reading enough. They're not, you got to be in the Word if you're going to teach it. Just an idea. But <laughs> they make mistakes because they're not reading the whole thing a lot. Well, why did he get the leprosy? I told you guys there are many books of the Bible, and some are parallel accounts, and that's where we're at right now. Some give more information. Some give less information, not contradictions, right? They're just giving us info. So the parallel account is in 2 Chronicles 26.1. Starts kind of the same way. All the people of Judah had crowned Amaziah's 16-year-old son, Uzziah, as his king in place of his father. After his father's death, Uzziah rebuilt the town of Elath and restored it to Judah, Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 52 years. His mother was Jechaliah from Jerusalem. So, similar-ish. says he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. If we keep reading, there's a guy, Zechariah, and it gets confusing because that's not the Zechariah, the priest that got killed, and it's not the Zechariah, book of Zechariah, the prophet. It's just a different one. Imagine that. Sometimes people can have the same name. Happens today, too. So that's what's going on there. He's a pretty good military leader. He defeats the Philistines, the Munites, might say Ammonites in your version. He also recruits a really big army. So there are 2,600 clan leaders running it, 307, 500,000, 500 men, 307,500 men. I'm very bad at math anyway. can remember numbers, but I can't count them. So he takes care of them. He gets them all the equipment they need. He even builds on Jerusalem's walls special structures to protect them while they're shooting arrows down at people. So he's doing well so far. If we keep reading, it says he becomes really powerful. Then, 2 Chronicles 26, 16. But when he had become powerful, he also became proud which led to his downfall. He sinned against the Lord his God by entering the sanctuary of the Lord's temple and personally burning incense on the incense altar. Azariah the high priest went in after him with 80 other priests of the Lord, all brave men. They confronted King Uzziah and said, it is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. That is the work of the priests alone, the descendants of Aaron, who are set apart for this work. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have sinned. The Lord God will not honor you for this. So he's standing there with the incense burner, and he's furious at the priests. But the leprosy breaks out on his forehead. They freak out. They get him out of there. And then again, he's in isolation. He even gets buried in a separate place because he has the leprosy. 
Uzziah's problem was that he didn't stay in his lane. So we heard Heather's story last week. And one of the things she mentioned is that, unfortunately, she had to go to the hospital at a certain point. And I'm not sure if she mentioned it or not, but a part of my story was that I've also been to the hospital. I had a TIA, but I don't really think it was that. You see, I was being called out of the business world and then into ministry, and I didn't want to go. I was basically like, nope, like Jonah, right? So he put me in the belly of the whale. One night in the hospital, not three. <laughs> so put me in time out to think about it a little bit. It was pretty serious. And so a part of that, luckily, I mean, it's not luck. It's a God incidence. My wife was home. Started to go numb, the whole left side of my body. And I'm like, uh-oh, this is not normal. <laughs> so what are stroke symptoms? Yup, Heather, you got to take me to the hospital. Now, this is an alarming thing to hear because I hate the hospital. I don't like it. It's because I do not enjoy germs. If you do, you're crazy. And don't label me. We talked about that <laughs> this morning. Anyway, had to, I can make this funny because everything's funny to me. So not to her. She gets me in the car and drove me to the hospital. And I'm pretty sure she broke every rule of the road that there is. Got me there quick, right? So here's the thing, though. I don't remember everything, but I know I got there fast. What if there was someone in the fast lane trying to police it? You got a middle lane person, maybe day drinker, and she can't get around. What if? You see, we aren't always privy to why someone might be doing something. So you have lane police going, it's 45. Blocking the lane for a woman who's trying to get her dying husband to the hospital. Think about it. You see, <laughs> and here's the thing, on the anniversary date of her sobriety, it all happened on the one year anniversary. All that's going on. And somebody there just needs to police a lane. You see, there's your business and there's none of your business. And so whatever she's doing, those traffic infractions, that's between her and Deputy Johnson. Right? That's his job. That's what we pay him for. Right? Like, you... That's it. That's not your job. It's your job to get in your own lane. Get out of the way. We don't know why. <laughs> this happens so much, whether it be in ministry, in our jobs, if we're being honest. It happens a lot. It's very important to stay in our own lane. This is Uzziah's problem. He became powerful, and he became proud. So sometimes people get powerful in one area, and then they think they know everything. Even though he was powerful in one area, it didn't make him a priest. <laughs> Have you ever had someone tell you how to do your job? I know Deputy Johnson has. <laughs> that guy was doing something way worse than I just did that you pulled me over for. Didn't you see them? <laughs> Am I causing... <laughs> Didn't you... What am I paying you for? Mm -hmm. But think about what you do. Think about what you do. If you're a professional, I'm sure you've had someone tell you how to do your job. But think about it. It's really annoying because maybe you went to school for a long time for that job. Maybe you've been doing that job for a really long time. You know what's up. And the person telling you how to do it usually doesn't know anything about it. It's frustrating. So think about it for a second. What did you hear? You might have heard 
something like, you don't know what you're doing. You're stupid. You're negligent. You didn't think of that? (laughs) It's insulting. Yet people do it all the time. Some people think they know everything. Disclaimer, because this is where some people who want to just continue doing this are going to go. I know where you're going to (laughs) go. But what about malpractice and negligence? Yes, that's a thing. But that's not the majority of the time, and that's not what I'm talking about. It's not used too many excuses. Not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about normative day-to-day stuff here. So for those who are always suspicious and accusatory of everything, you're displaying an attitude of arrogance. Like Uzziah, powerful and proud. So we need to stay humble, and we need to stay in our own lane. But from Uzziah's time to now, there are many kings who think they should be priests. But they don't understand that there is much from one area that simply does not translate to another. There are some things that do, but it takes humility, obedience, and time to figure that out. For us, it took humility, obedience, patience, and time. And I'll We did open our mouths sometimes, and we shouldn't have. But I'll give us this much credit. When we came into church, Heather was asked first. She's both better looking and smarter than I am. So (laughs) into leadership. (laughs) All right? So you're a good businesswoman. We'll use you here. Didn't ask. Then I'm later. I came kicking and screaming, needed to go to the hospital, all that stuff. (laughs) A little more stubborn sometimes. But... Here's the thing. We at least had the common sense to recognize that the pastor was there for a reason. He respected his training, (laughs) seminary, discipleship, whatever he went through. And we respected the fact that he was in this a lot more than we were. He knew the rule book. So we knew, stay humble. Sometimes we didn't understand why he was doing stuff. Sometimes he would complain a little bit. "Mm." He's got to have a reason. Knows what's going on. You see, (laughs) this is not a career. So whatever you do in ministry in the church is not a career. Anyone trying to advance through ministries to get a career? (laughs) Wrong. Disqualified. This is a calling. This is something you get called into. It's not something that really anyone in their right mind wants. Tony Johnson was a pastor. Now a cop tells you everything that you need to know. (laughs) We didn't ask for these roles. She didn't ask for any of these roles. We were called into it. We didn't even want them. We're invited. You see, when the Lord calls you into something, it's almost always into a position of humility, not elevation. The key to knowing your place is getting invited into that space. A lot of people, if you think the Lord is saying it, but there's no one confirming it, that's not the Lord. Leadership is always going to confirm it when it's time. Now, Jesus clarifies this for us. Check this out. Luke 14, starting at verse 7. When Jesus noticed that all who had come to the dinner were trying to sit in the seats of honor near the head of the table... He gave them this advice. When you are invited to a wedding feast, don't sit in the seat of honor. What if someone who is more distinguished than you, imagine that, has also been invited? The host will come and say, give this person your seat. Then you will be embarrassed and you will have to take whatever seat is left at the foot of the table. Instead, take the lowest place at the foot of the table. Then when your host sees you, he will come and say, friend. We have a better place for you. Then you will be honored in front of all the other guests. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. 
those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Now, Jesus might have had this in mind, Proverbs 25, 6. Don't demand an audience with the king or push for a place among the great. It's better to wait for an invitation to the head of the table than to be sent away in public disgrace. Let's take a look at another proverb. Pride goes before destruction. Humility precedes honor. Pride leads to destruction. Humility leads to honor. Another proverb. And look at this. 14, 12, 16, 25. There's a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. When God repeats it, it's important. You need to pay attention. We have to stay off the path of pride and take the highway or the low way to humility. So we've been doing a lot of affirmation and confirmation lately. So this is really important. Being a martial arts instructor formerly, have not done that in a long time. Also being a pastor, your students require encouragement. It's just required. You don't know. You're not sure. And then there are in martial arts people beating you up all the time here, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> Tell me about it. You know, you shouldn't be doing that here. But it can get discouraging because here's the thing. Sadly, sadly, what we do here is different. It's different. That's what people come in. When they're in the Word, I can always tell. They don't come back. Or when they're not in the Word. When they're in the Word, they say this. That was refreshing. And I think, that's really sad. But welcome home. <laughs> Seriously. I've heard, that was too many scriptures. Huh? Is there such a thing? So, we're holding firm. We're holding firm. But the problem is, and this requires affirmation, I'm going to give you a little confirmation in a minute, because the rest of the world, other people, maybe they left, are saying something different. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's not the way you should do it. You gotta, we have a better program guide here than that. Right? Or they're out there, and there's more of them. There's more bad stuff out there than good stuff. It's like fine dining, right? If you can relate it to something. And that's just a thing. Well, then why does everybody do that or say that? Because the majority is usually not correct. Jesus told us this, didn't he? It shouldn't be a surprise. We have shows out there that are very, very popular. Let's say, no, this isn't, you know, the author of this one didn't get it right. Let's just add to it, add a whole bunch of stuff. And we'll make it better. Wow. Talk about arrogance. This is perfect. We don't need anything else. Perfect. But it's wildly popular to add to it and actually call it like a Bible study. Are you kidding? <laughs> Simon the Zealot does karate now. That's a real thing. I, saw, I thought it was a joke, a parody. This is unbelievable. The level of arrogance and the majority is going that way. But what did Jesus say? The road to hell, very wide. The right path is very narrow. So there will be less of us that make it. Here's the thing. And this is interesting. So I'm going to share confirmation. I've been sitting on this one for a long time. Because what's been happening is God has been sending people, not just from New York into the church, but he'll send people, whether they pass through or whether they stay, it's not the point. And they're like prophesying and they don't know it. <laughs> and they'll be from New York, but not just from New York, but like the same place. Like one person came through, he actually was a doctor at the hospital where Sophie was born, my daughter. What are you trying to tell me? This is too sniperish. Like this is like weird, right? And they'll have different things to tell me and they don't know. And so I figured it out. You see, when we were in New York, if you know my story, we didn't do like the typical karate school thing where like the kids get the black belts and you have the karate birthday parties and whatever it is. We did none of that. It was kind of like what this church is for martial arts. Basically like we want to actually do it right. Like <laughs> this is about fighting. You're going to come here, learn how to fight. You're going to get tapped out. Like that's just a thing or knocked out or something by a girl. 
whatever. <laughs> so yeah, she told you about that. But anyway, we tried to keep the quality really high. And at every turn, we were discouraged over and over. No, if you want to be successful, you got to give the black belts a kid. We can't. You can't get one in this art till you're 18 and you really, really, really know how to fight. I had a black belt already. It took me 10 years doing it professionally to get one in this. It was hard. But we were like, no quality, no quality, no quality. We stuck with it, slept on the mats. It was hard. But eventually, the cops started finding out. And it would fill up. They brought their families. The people who got it started coming. And then everybody started coming. And the gym got really, really big. And so what the Lord is saying to me through this is, hold the line. Keep your integrity. My word is enough. If you check off all the right boxes, the Lord will send all the right people in. And we're seeing that happen here. It's amazing. So I want to tell you about one of these happenings. CJ and Beth. They come in how many weeks ago? A two month? Two? That long? Wow, I'm getting old. I'm going to die really quick. So anyway, <laughs> two months. I thought it was two weeks. Anyway, <laughs> I'm ready, Lord. So... <laughs> Uh, but anyway, they came in, maybe it's two months ago, you're right, I don't know, I'm probably wrong, not good with dates. They get introduced, it's Alani, or Alani introduces himself to them, resident fact checker here. And so they're seated up front, which is weird for first timers, so I'm like, all right, now, I make it a point to try to get you, if you're new here, I'm trying to figure out, it's hard to see with the lights who's new, and I try to get you first, but then the people here all the time interrupt me, and I'm like, get out of the way, I got to get to the new people, we'll see you in the cafe. <laughs> but, anyway, but anyway, I get to them, right, because they're right up front, it's easy. Lonnie makes the introduction, he gets it, he knows what's up. So the first thing is, CJ throws Beth under the bus. So we'll work on that later, the counseling and all that other stuff. He's like, she's been watching you online forever. She loves your messages. And I'm like, oh, okay, we'll see you in my office if you come back. But I ask them where they're from. And they say, New York. I'm like, where in New York? And he kind of does what some people do. He's like, ah, oh, you wouldn't know kind of thing. I'm like, oh, no, trust me, I probably do. This is happening a lot. And so he describes where they come from. And it's literally right down the street from where I live. We know all the same places, all the same things, the church, right down, everything. And it's kind of mind-blowing. And so Beth is like uh, paraphrasing something. So I'm not going to do like any accents. Paraphrasing, like basically, I've tried out all these churches and I never felt home. That was the word. Never felt at home, but I feel like I'm at home here. So I gave her a big hug and I said, welcome home. Clearly, the Lord sent you here. That's some confirmation, right? Gets better. So they say they're coming to Bible study, and pastors, we get, like, pessimistic. We're a little cynical because we get lied to all of the time. So they say we're coming to Bible study. I'm like, all right. You know what I mean? Right. There's, like, a 2% chance of that happening. So, okay, whatever. Wednesday comes. Now, here's the thing. I do not like dressing like this. So I'm in my office, I'm in my shorts, my sandals, I'm comfy. But Bible study is coming, and I understand that when I'm sitting here, my hairy legs are at eye level. That's disgusting. So I make sure that I put a pair of pants on before the Bible study. Usually a good idea before you do a Bible study. And so I'm on my way out of the offices to go get my pants. And there's Beth right there, right in my face. And she's like, I really need to talk to you. You know, what's a better time, before the Bible study or after the Bible study? Not seeing this in my head, neither. Neither, really. <laughs> so this is not, not a good time. But, you know, I'm like lesser of two evils. What do I do? So I'm, I, it's been a long day. Wednesday's a really long day. I'm here all day. I'm meeting with people, doing a lot of different things. And I do the Bible study. I get kind of exhausted. I want to go home and eat. That's it. I'm done, right? So I think, okay, before. I know this material pretty well. I got it. There's nothing she can say that's going to throw me. I'm good to go. Before, have a seat on the couch. She's like, exactly, right? Pretty good memory sometimes. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, get my pants on. Good thing when you're meeting with a female to do, guys. So I sit down, and we start talking. And she says, you don't know me, but I know you. Pastor face. Hmm. Hmm. Right? So you're just being quiet. She's from New York. She's not going to be quiet. So I just let her keep going. I don't have to prod her along 
at all. She's going to give me all of the information and then some. So you've got to do better than that, but not saying that. <laughs> yeah, you don't know me, but I know you. I'm like, hmm. Next thing. I've wronged you. Mm. Get in line. I've wronged you. That's pastors just get wronged. That's like our job. I stole from you. Mm. Get in line. All right? So then it gets better. I stole from your house. I'm listening now. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm listening now. Now I'm like, okay, you know, this lady still may be crazy, but this is getting interesting. And you know, <laughs> it's developing, it's going somewhere. All right, so she gets a little more specific. She's like, yeah, you know, <clears throat> now here's where I got to explain something. I'll give you background that I'm beginning to understand because I don't think it's the house here. I kind of know where she's going because she's from New York. So when we moved here, we sold a portion of our business. We kept the one in New York running. Residual income's nice. So that's why I didn't want to leave it. We kept that one running, and then we were going to open another one. We did. We opened another one here, right? So double the money, yay, and that's, that was our mindset. And so what we did to compensate the instructors whom we thought we could trust was we let them live in our house that we still had in New York. Kind of a good deal should be kind of enough for teaching just a couple classes a week, or so we thought. Now, we discovered this a little later, but those instructors decided to rob us blind. <laughs> they robbed us. Now, it wasn't obvious through the thing, and if you know how there's testimony, we had reasons for not being able to go back and forth. She was in several car accidents, actually. It was a bad time. We kind of knew it, but not really. We were being robbed. Literally, like towards the end, I think the whole house got cleaned out. <laughs> it's just everything. They should not have stainless steel professional grade appliances. Anyway, I'm over it. <laughs> but anyway, so here's the thing about Beth. She was not like taking the stuff and selling it. This individual was, she worked for the person and just asked her to help. So I don't think she was wise about it right away, no. So it wasn't like malicious or anything like that, but later she realized that was really fishy, like that was really weird, what was going on here. So just here's the thing, <laughs> just wrap your minds around, it was enough that they lived down the street from me. Now this, and now it's attached to the martial arts. So this is God saying, uh-uh, okay, this is a new start, do what you did there, hold the line, but better because it's for me and not money now. So this is what I'm gathering now in this moment. I'm kind of trying not to smirk and say, ah, oh, you're a prophet. You don't know it. So that's what's going on. Now here's the next set of things that come out of Beth's mouth. If you got to call the cops, that's fine. I don't know what the statute of limitations is, but that's fine. And it kind of like, it like jolted me because I don't care anymore. I don't care anymore. Jesus healed that care for that kind of stuff. I'm like, I don't know. Maybe you robbed my house now. I don't need so much stuff, right? So it kind of like jolted me back to New York or something. Like, I couldn't believe she's saying this. And I was trying to process it. And it was really difficult in the moment because I'm like, where? well, I get it. But then something else occurred to me in this moment. That was obedient. The Lord told her to come in and admit a crime. Let's think about it. If it was a lot of stuff, yeah, like grand theft. <laughs> admit to being an accessory to a crime. She doesn't know me. She realized it after she came to church. She figured it out later. Realized, whoa, that's who that person is. So what are the chances that she's going to come here and that I'm a pastor now? What are the chances? She had robbed my house. The Lord tells her, go in there, confess it, apologize. What? God incidents. There's no coincidence here. None. Absolutely. Just if she had known that instructor, that would be kind of mind-blowing. All the places she could have went to church. So all this is going on in, in my mind. It's like I'm trying to figure it out. Like, because being a pastor, basically, don't say the wrong thing, don't say the wrong thing, don't, especially me, right? So, you know, that's really it. And I'm like, oh, you know, what, what is from the Lord? What's from New York? Like, I got to kind of parse this out right now. She's taking me back. 
And I said, I don't need to say this. I don't need to say this because Jesus has changed me. I'm just not that person anymore. I barely recognize him. So I don't need to say this, but you need to hear this. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. Welcome home. Think about this for a moment. What would you have done? She could have picked another church. People don't come back here for a lot less than that. Think about it. People do not return here for a lot less than that. She came back. I don't know. How many, don't raise your hands, but just think. Would you have just said, this is pretty difficult. I think I'm just going to find another church. But here's the thing. The Lord told her to come back here, to come to Bible study and confess this. What she didn't know is the Lord was talking to me through her. It wasn't about that. Amazing. You see, when you are humble and obedient, when you stay in the lane the Lord created for you, regardless of what the cost might be, when you stay on the Lord's path, he will lead you home. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for everyone who came here today, who watched online. I just hope they understand that your path, whether in this world or ultimately the next, staying on your path will lead them home. It will be difficult. We will be faced with trials. But please, Lord, encourage everyone who's hearing this to stay on your path. You're saying, come home to me. Lord, build us up. Strengthen us by the power of your Holy Spirit so that we can be wonderful vessels, vehicles for your love, your grace, your mercy. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.